This is the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth quarter, 2021. Lesson 12 from our series Present Truth in Deuteronomy is titled Deuteronomy in the New Testament, ready for teaching on December 18, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, December 11. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is there for us to read, and it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And we believe that, Lord. We've been studying the book of Deuteronomy, and we know that it is referenced throughout other parts of the Scripture. And this week we're going to be looking at how it is an integral part of the New Testament. And as people listen in Boston or Edinburgh or Barbados or Florianopolis or Warunga or Madagascar or Lebanon or Zimbabwe, I pray that each of us will not feel alone but know that there are others who are listening as well, but also not feel alone because they are able to be with you at this time. Please bless us and may your Holy Spirit guide our thinking in this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Let's read that again, Matthew 4, 4. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The New Testament is saturated with the Old. That is, the inspired writers of the New Testament quoted the inspired writers of the Old as a source of authority. Jesus himself said, It is written in Matthew 4.4, 4, meaning it is written in the Old Testament. And he said that, the scriptures must be fulfilled in Mark 14.49, meaning the scriptures of the Old Testament. And when Jesus met two disciples on the road to Emmaus, instead of doing a miracle to show them who he was, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, Luke 24.27. Whether direct Old Testament quotations or allusions or references to stories or prophecies, the New Testament writers constantly use the Old Testament to buttress, even justify their claims. And among the books often quoted or referenced to was Deuteronomy, along with Psalms and Isaiah. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Galatians 1 and 2 Corinthians, Hebrews and the pastoral epistles and Revelation all go back to Deuteronomy. This week we'll look at a few of those instances and see what truth, present truth, we can draw from them. Sunday, December 12, it is written. Read Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11. How did Jesus respond to Satan's temptations in the wilderness? And what is the important lesson here for us in his response? Matthew 4, beginning at verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, afterward he was hungry. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, 
All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Jesus didn't argue with Satan or debate with him. He simply quoted scripture because as the word of God, it is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, we read in Hebrews 4 verse 12. And in each case, the word he quoted was from Deuteronomy. How interesting that Jesus in the wilderness chose to quote texts that were given to Israel in the wilderness as well. In the first temptation, Jesus referred to Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3. Moses had been recounting to the people of Israel how the Lord had provided for them all those years in the wilderness, including giving them manna, all part of a refining process as the Lord was seeking to teach them spiritual lessons. And among those lessons was the one that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God fed you physical food, but he also gives you spiritual nourishment. You can't take only the first without the second. Jesus used the image of bread as a transition to Deuteronomy and to rebuke Satan and the doubt he tried to instill in Jesus. In the second temptation, Jesus went back to Deuteronomy 6.16, where Moses pointed the people back to their rebellion in Massa. Deuteronomy 6.16 reads, You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. And in Exodus 17, verses 1 to 7, we read, Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people, and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod, with which you struck the river, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the contention of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Moses pointed the people back to their rebellion in Massa, saying, You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. The word for tempt can mean try and test. The Lord already had shown them again and again his power and willingness to provide for them, yet the moment trouble came, they cried out, is the Lord among us or not, in Exodus 17, 7? And it was from that story that Jesus drew from the word of God to rebuke Satan. In the third temptation, Satan this time sought to get Christ to bow down and worship him. What an open and blatant revelation of just who he really was and what he really wanted. Rather than debate, Jesus rebuked Satan and again reverted to the word of God, Deuteronomy, where the Lord was warning his people about what would happen if they were to fall away and worship other gods in Deuteronomy 6.13. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him, meaning him and him alone. So to finish the day. How can we learn to draw more power in our own lives through our study of the Word of God in order to reflect more fully the character of Jesus and, like him, resist Satan's temptations?
Monday, December 13, Lifting Up Faces In Deuteronomy chapter 10, Moses again was recounting Israel's history and again used those accounts to admonish his people to faithfulness. Amid that admonishment, he said something else. Read Deuteronomy 10, 17-19. What's the essential message to the people here? And why is this message relevant to God's church today? Deuteronomy 10, 17-19. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow, and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. The phrase shows no partiality is translated from a Hebrew figure of speech. It means literally that he does not lift up faces. This is believed to have come from a legal setting in which the judge or king sees the face of the person on trial and, based on that person's status, important person or someone insignificant, the judge or king renders a verdict. The implication here in Deuteronomy is that the Lord doesn't treat people in such a manner, despite his great power and might. He's fair with everyone, regardless of their status. This truth, of course, was revealed in the life of Jesus and how he treated even the most despised in society. Read Acts chapter 4. 10 verse 34, Romans 2.11, Galatians 2.6, Ephesians 6.9, Colossians 3.25, and 1 Peter 1.17. How do these texts make use of Deuteronomy 10 verse 17? First of all, Acts 10.34, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. Romans 2.11, For there is no partiality with God. Galatians 2.6, But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. And Ephesians 6.11, 6 verse 9, and you masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. And Colossians chapter 3 verse 25, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. And 1 Peter 1, 17, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. However varied the circumstances in each one of these references, in Ephesians, Paul tells masters to be careful how they treat their slaves. In Romans, Paul is talking about the fact that when it comes to salvation and condemnation, there's no difference between Jews and Gentiles. They all go back to Deuteronomy and to the idea that God does not lift up faces. And if the God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, won't do it, then certainly we should shouldn't as well. Particularly in how Paul in Romans frames it, we can see a revelation of the gospel. We are all on the same plane, regardless of who we are in terms of status. We are all fallen beings in need of God's saving grace. And the good news is that, regardless of our status, we all are offered salvation in Jesus Christ. So to finish the day, How often, even subtly, do you lift up faces, and why does the cross show us how sinful that attitude really is? Tuesday, December 14. Cursed on a Tree.
Read Galatians 3, 1 to 14. What is Paul saying there that is relevant to us today? And how does he use Deuteronomy 27, 26 and Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23 to make his point? To begin with, we'll read those two sections from Deuteronomy. First of all, Deuteronomy 27, 26. Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law by observing them, and all the people shall say, Amen, and Deuteronomy 21, 22 to 23. If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, for he who is hanged is accursed of God. And now Galatians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This also I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness." Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law, are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Unfortunately, it's common in Christianity to use this letter of Galatians as some kind of justification for not keeping the law, the Ten Commandments. Of course, that argument is really used as a reason not to keep the fourth commandment, as if keeping that one commandment, as opposed to the other nine, is somehow an expression of the legalism that Paul was dealing with here. Yet, Paul was not speaking against the law, and certainly nothing in this passage could justify breaking the Sabbath commandment. The key can be found in Galatians 3.10, where he writes that all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. And then he quotes Deuteronomy 27.26. The issue isn't obedience to the law, but relying on the law, a tough position, if not an impossible one, for falling beings such as ourselves. Paul's point is that we are not saved by the works of the law, but by Christ's death on our behalf, which is credited to us by faith. His emphasis here is on what Christ has done for us on the cross. And to help make this point, he refers back to Deuteronomy again, this time Deuteronomy 21 verse 23. Like Jesus, Paul says, it is written, showing the authority of the Old Testament, and now he quotes from a text dealing with someone who, having committed a capital crime, and having been executed for it, was then hung on a tree, perhaps as a deterrent to others. Paul, though, uses that as a symbol for Christ's substitutionary death in our behalf. Christ became a curse for us in that he faced the curse of the law, that is, death, which all humans would face because all have violated the law. The good news of the gospel, however, 
is that the curse that should have been ours became his at the cross, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, as it says in Galatians 3.14. Or, as Ellen G. White said it in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 63, none but Christ could redeem fallen man from the curse of the law and bring him again into harmony with heaven. Christ would take upon himself the guilt and shame of sin, sin so offensive to a holy God that it must separate the Father and the Son. And so to finish today, think about what you would face if you were to receive the just punishment for whatever wrongs you have committed. However, because Christ bore the punishment for your wrongs in himself so that you don't have to, what should your response to his sacrifice be? Wednesday, December 15. A prophet like unto thee. Again and again the Lord had warned Israel not to follow after the practices of the nations around them. On the contrary, they were to be witnesses to those nations, as we read in Deuteronomy 4, 6-8. Therefore be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely, this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it, as the Lord our God is to us, for whatever reason we may call upon him? And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I have set before you this day? In Deuteronomy 18, 9-14, Moses again warns them against their specific practices, which were an abomination to the Lord, in verse 12. Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 14. When you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God, for these nations which you will dispossess Listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. In this context, then, he tells them that they must be blameless before the Lord your God, in verse 13. Read Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 to 19. What is Moses telling them there? Then compare this with Acts 3.22, Acts 7.37, how do Peter and Stephen apply Deuteronomy 18.18? 18, 18? Deuteronomy 18, beginning at verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear, according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the prophet said to me, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him." And Acts chapter 3, verse 22, For Moses truly said to our fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And Acts 7, 37, This is what Moses, who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. In reference to the covenant at Sinai, 
Moses talks about how the children of Israel, at the revelation of God's law in Exodus 20, 18-21, wanted Moses to act as a mediator, an intercessor between them and God. It is then that Moses promises them twice, and these verses come from Deuteronomy 18, 15-18, that the Lord will raise up a prophet like Moses, the idea being, given the context that this prophet like Moses also will be, among other things, an intercessor between the people and the Lord. And so we look up Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 to 21. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, and when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Many centuries later, both Peter and Stephen quote the text in reference to Jesus. Peter is seeking to show that Jesus is the fulfilment of what had been spoken of by all his holy prophets in Acts 3.21, and that the leaders need to obey him and what he says. That is, Peter uses this text, which the Jews knew about, and applies it directly to Jesus, with the idea that they need to repent for what they have done to him. In Acts 3 verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Next, in Acts 7.37, when Stephen, though in a different context than Peter's, is proclaiming Jesus, he too refers back to that famous promise, and he too claims that it pointed to Jesus. He is saying that Moses, in his role in history and leading the Jews, had prefigured Jesus. That is, as Peter had done, Stephen was seeking to show the people that Jesus was the fulfilment of prophecy and that they need to listen to him. Contrary to the charge against him that Stephen had been speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God in Acts 6.11, Stephen proclaims Jesus as the Messiah, a direct fulfilment of what God had promised through Moses. And so to finish the day, how do these verses show us just how central Jesus is to the entire Bible, and why all our understanding of it must be Christ-centred? Thursday, December 16. A Fearful Thing The book of Hebrews, in all its depth and sublimity, is in many ways just one long exhortation to Jewish believers in Jesus, and what it exhorts them to do is stay faithful to the Lord. This faithfulness, of course, should stem from our love of God, of who He is, and of His character and goodness, most powerfully expressed at the cross of Christ. Sometimes, though, human beings need to be reminded of what the terrible consequences of falling away will be. That is, we need to remember that, in the end, if we don't accept what Jesus has done for us in having paid the penalty for our sins, we will have to pay that penalty ourselves, and that means weeping and gnashing of teeth, as it says in Matthew 22, verse 13, followed by eternal destruction. Read Hebrews 10, verses 28 to 31. What is Paul saying, and how does it apply to us as well? Hebrews 10, beginning at verse 28. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. 
For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. How interesting that in order to exhort Jewish believers to stay faithful to God, Paul quotes Deuteronomy, an earlier exhortation to Jewish believers to stay faithful to God. Paul quotes Deuteronomy 17.6 in regard to the fact that someone deemed worthy of death would face that death only after at least two people testified against that person. But Paul did this to make the point that if unfaithfulness could lead to death under the old covenant, how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy of who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace in Hebrews 10.29. In other words, you have more light and more truth than they did, and you know about the sacrifice of the Son of God for your sins. Thus, if you fall away, your condemnation will be greater than theirs. Then Paul immediately goes back to Deuteronomy now to Deuteronomy 32.35, simply to buttress his argument, considering what they had been given in Christ and their knowledge of the great provision made for them, the Lord who said, Vengeance is mine, will judge his people for their apostasy and faithfulness. After all, he had judged their forefathers, who didn't have what these New Testament Jews did, the fuller revelation of God's love revealed at the cross. Thus, basically, Paul was saying, be warned. And just a reminder, Deuteronomy 32, verse 35 reads, Vengeance is mine, and recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them. And so to finish the day. The Lord will judge his people, we read in Deuteronomy 32, 36. What's our only hope? in that judgment. And the answer is found in Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Friday, December 17. Just as the Old Testament quotes itself, that is, some of the prophets would quote or refer to, for example, texts from the five books of Moses, the New Testament is filled with direct quotes, references and allusions to the Old. Psalms, Isaiah and Deuteronomy were among the most quoted. Often, too, the New Testament writers would quote from what is known as the Septuagint, sometimes called the Greek Old Testament, which was the earliest known Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. The first five books of the Bible, known as the Torah or the Pentateuch, were translated in the 3rd century BC, and the rest of the Old Testament about the 2nd century BC. One can learn a great deal, too, about how to interpret the Bible by how the inspired writers of the New Testament used the Old. And one of the first lessons we could learn is that, unlike so much Bible scholarship today, the New Testament writers never raised any question about the authenticity or authority of the Old Testament books. Nothing in their writings revealed, for instance, doubt about the historicity of Old Testament stories from the existence of Adam and Eve, the fall and the flood, to the call of Abraham and so forth. The scholarship that questions these things is just human scepticism, and it should have no place in the hearts and minds of Seventh-day Adventists. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Considering all the light that we have been given as Seventh-day Adventists, what should it teach us about the great responsibility upon us to be faithful to the truths that we have been given? 
to read again Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 14, what modern manifestations of these abominations to the Lord exist today, and how can we make sure that we avoid them? Deuteronomy 18, beginning at verse 9. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God, for these nations which you will dispossess listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. And discussion question number three. Why, of all people, should Christians who understand the universal application of Christ's death on the cross never lift up faces, as we discussed in Monday's lesson? How can we recognise in ourselves the tendency to do just that? And don't we fool ourselves if we deny that there is at least some tendency in us to do just that? How can the cross, and keeping the cross before us, cure us of this wrong attitude? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Unforgettable Birthday, and it's by O oh Dongchun. Nine year old Ji Yul is a popular boy at his school in rural South Korea. The teacher also likes him because he helps clean up the classroom. But Ji Yul had a problem. His friends did not want to come to his house to play after school. Ji Yul often went to their homes and saw their new toys, aquariums and pets. But no one seemed to want to come to his house. He didn't understand why they wouldn't come to his house. One day, when Ji Yul invited a friend to play after school, the boy said, Mother said I can play with you at school, but I cannot go to your house. Why did your mother say that? Ji Yul asked. It's because your house is a church, the friend replied. Ji Yul is the son of a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, and his home occupies a wing of a Seventh-day Adventist church building. Most of the town's other residents attend three large churches that belong to other Christian denominations in the town centre. The parents of Ji Yul's friends didn't want their children going to the house inside the Adventist church. Ji Yul told his parents about the conversation at school. His parents wondered how Ji Yul could have friends over to play. Seeing that Ji Yul would soon have his birthday, they decided that instead of going out, they would celebrate at home for the first time. Ji Yul prayed earnestly, Please let my friends come to the birthday party and have a good time, he prayed. Give their parents a good heart toward the church. Ji Yul made birthday invitations with the name and location of the church. Together with small gifts, he gave the cards to all his classmates. Finally, Ji Yul's birthday arrived. When the party started at 11am, ten friends showed up to celebrate the day with him. Ji Yul was so happy. For the first time, he could play with friends at home. From that day on, if there is a concert or another event at the church, Ji Yul makes invitations and distributes them to his classmates. He has learned that the more often his friends come to church, the more fun he has at home. Now he has three friends who come regularly to his house to play. He prays that some day his friends will worship with him at the church. And there's a lovely photograph of Ji Yul just here to the left. This mission story illustrates spiritual growth objective number six of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan. To increase accession, retention, reclamation and participation of children, youth and young adults. 
Learn more at IWillGo2020.org. This quarter, your 13th Sabbath offering will support two mission projects in South Korea. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind, and It Is Written. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes, and can also be heard on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.